Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. I intend taking both constituency and general supplementaries after question two. Members wishing to ask such questions should press their request to speak buttons during question two, and members should press on specific questions if they wish to ask a supplementary on questions three to seven. I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And could I start by wishing everyone across Scotland a very happy Diwali. Uh, Scotland has the highest drug death rate in Europe. Every solution should be considered to tackle this crisis, and they should be considered urgently. Why did it take 10 overdoses this weekend in a single prison for the government to accept Scottish Conservative proposals to cut down on the supply of drugs in our prisons? First Minister. Uh, let me also take the opportunity uh, to wish those celebrating across the country a very uh, happy and peaceful Diwali. Uh, we, and I've been very open about this, we have a significant challenge uh, when it comes to drugs deaths and we are determined uh, to make sure uh, that we are open to ideas, to suggestions and that we are genuinely doing everything reasonable we can to turn that around. Uh, within that overall uh, challenge, there is a particular challenge uh, in our prisons and I think all of us understand the different factors that are at play there. Um, so I would hope that across this chamber we could come together to welcome the ways in which we are seeking to change past practice, to recognise where perhaps uh, we should have done things uh, differently in the past and do them differently in the future. I, I hope uh, that there is an appetite to build consensus on this and to that end, as I have said to uh, the leader of the Conservative Party before, I am open to suggestions, including, of course, as I have said many times in the Chamber before, uh, considering the wider proposals that have been put forward uh, in the proposal for draft legislation that the Conservatives have brought. So I continue uh, to be open-minded and we will continue to seek to do the right things, backed by investment, to turn this situation around. Douglas Ross. The First Minister said she's been very open about this issue, and she has. She's accepted she took her eye off the ball with Scotland's drug deaths. But the eye is still off the ball, because for months we have highlighted the issue of drugs re reaching prisoners through mail. And we offered a solution. Russell Finlay raised this with the government five times over two months. When it was raised in this chamber with the Drugs Minister, Angela Constance, she said, and this is a direct quote, and I'm reminded that the First Minister just said that we need to work together and, and be consensual. Her own Drugs Minister said to Russell Finlay when he raised this issue, Mr Finlay is a big boy now. He doesn't need his mammy to hold his hand. I'm sure he will be able to address any outstanding matters that he has with the Cabinet Shocking. Secretary for Justice. Shocking. This is about drug overdoses and people dying. Was that response really worthy of a government minister? First Minister. Look, on, on a serious issue uh, like this, I, I think people across the chamber would accept, I hope they would accept, I, I'm absolutely sure they will not agree with everything uh, Angela Constance says or I say on this issue, but I, I do hope people would agree that Angela Constance in particular uh, has not just been open to different approaches, but has actually taken forward already in her tenure as Drugs Minister uh, many uh, different approaches to try to tackle this challenge. On the uh, specific one uh, about the situation in prisons and in particular the issue of photocopying of prisoner mail, uh, it is is the case uh, that the prison service have taken time to consider and, and rightly taken time to consider the range of very serious operational and legal considerations. That includes taking into account uh, prisoners' rights, uh, which are often determined through court judgments uh, around the handling of their correspondence. That is a fundamental consideration. Uh, so they have taken uh, that time and uh, the Justice Secretary, as he outlined uh, to Parliament on Tuesday, after detailed operational consideration, uh, the prison service now will be implementing this change. Um, I, I recognise that on particularly issues as important as this. Everybody wants uh, to see government operate and move uh, with speed, uh, and I uh, share that view. But when we're dealing with serious issues like this, it is important uh, that we do take the time to consider all of the implications, uh, particularly when those implications are, are of legal considerations. That's what has happened here. And I hope now people across the chamber who have been calling for this would welcome the progress that we are able to make. Douglas Ross. It's not just Angela Constance, though. Another government minister, Lorna Slater, said recently that drugs are not inherently dangerous. And this week, the Justice Secretary, Keith Brown, dismissed another serious concern 
that we've raised. Here's the standard operating procedure that prison officers have to work to. It says prisoners have the option to have items contaminated with drugs, safely stored and returned to them on their release. Prison officers are telling us that they're having to hand drugs back to the prisoners as they leave. Her Cabinet Secretary refused to give a serious response to this issue. So will the First Minister commit to ending this practice immediately? First Minister, I, I, in the spirit of openness, uh, I will certainly look at that. It is the case that prisoners uh, have rights. Often these rights are upheld in courts of law, and we have to consider these things carefully in making sure uh, that we address these things uh, properly. Um, and, and there is a, a deeper issue here that I, I would ask, uh, again, in that spirit of openness and, and sincerity in trying to find the solutions to this, Douglas Ross to consider. I accept his sincerity on this issue with, without, uh, without doubt or equivocation. But it is too easy for all of us across the chamber to oversimplify some of these issues. And quoting uh, ministers, uh, forgetting uh, to understand the nuances around this, uh, the factors behind behind the drugs crisis are complex. I think we all understand that. So let's not oversimplify. Let's not take uh, quotes out of context. Let's focus on the substance of solutions, as I believe Douglas Ross has been doing on this issue and try to find maximum consensus. So the particular issue he's raised there, I will go away and look at that in detail. And if we consider there is a change that is necessary and, a, uh, and appropriate and possible to make there, then I undertake that we will give that due and serious consideration. Douglas Ross. I'm not taking quotes out of context. I've issued and, and reminded the First Minister of the response we've had from three of her government members. Yeah. And this government has to finally start treating this crisis with the urgency it deserves. The Prison Officers Association have told us that they have been overwhelmed with unprecedented levels of drug abuse in our prisons. Her government's making it harder for them to do their job. They gave prisoners £2.7 million pounds worth of unhackable phones that were then hacked and used to deal drugs. Yeah. Scottish Prison Service documents show there have been over 2,200 incidents of prisoners misusing these devices. Given the obvious abuse of these phones for criminal activity, will she now commit to removing the phones that have been hacked from Scotland's prisons? First Minister. Well, on the issue, uh, and can I say we are treating this issue uh, seriously and with urgency. Sometimes there are complex uh, situations and issues that have to be properly uh, considered and thought through, and that's what we will do, because uh, frankly, we don't progress anything if we fail to do that. On the issue of mobile phones, I think it's firstly important uh, to remember the context for this, the provision of mobile phones in the absence, uh, during particularly the early stages of the pandemic, of in-person contact with loved ones over a sustained period of time has been vital in addressing the negative impact of COVID in our prisons, not just for prisoners, but also for staff and uh, families, children in particular, impacted by the imprisonment of parents. Now, the vast majority of the over 10,000 phones issued uh, were used entirely as intended. Uh, and the breaches of the rules are taken very seriously by the prison service. Uh, robust monitoring, robust monitoring, which detected uh, where there were breaches, detected a small minority, around 7% uh, of handsets, had been tampered with. Uh, that is not acceptable, but it is the robust monitoring that detected that and allowed steps to be taken uh, to prevent that in future. So these are serious issues. They are often complex issues, uh, and I hope all of us uh, will treat them in that way as we face up to and address uh, the issues of drugs deaths in society uh, generally, but in our prisons in particular. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Thank you, President Officer. Can I join others in wishing all those celebrating Diwali uh, a very happy Diwali coming through these uh, really dark times? I think it's quite poignant that families will be celebrating the Festival uh, of Light. President Officer, this week we have seen emergency doctors tell us that there have been 231 excess deaths due to delays at a &E. That's 231 people who could have survived if our hospitals were properly resourced. The Royal College of Nursing tell us that their members are overworked. We have even heard stories of nurses going home crying and many leaving the profession early. That is because our NHS is 3,500 nurses short. On top of that, our a &E waiting times are the worst they have ever been. And the First Minister's response is not to fix the problem, but to tell people they are the problem and not to go to a &E. This government has been repeatedly warned, been in denial, 
and lives are being lost. When will the First Minister take personal responsibility and act? First Minister. I, I take personal responsibility uh, for everything this government is responsible for every single day. Uh, there were three related issues raised in Anna Sarwar's question and I want to address them in turn. Uh, firstly, our NHS is working under extreme pressure right now. Everybody, uh, and I certainly recognise that, and I want again to pay tribute to and express my gratitude to nurses, doctors, everybody working in our National Health Service. Uh, nursing and midwifery staffing, though, in Scotland is currently at a record high. Uh, since this government has been in office, there has been an 11.7 per cent increase in qualified nurses and uh, midwives. The number of qualified nursing and midwifery staff working in our NHS has increased now for nine consecutive uh, years. We've got uh, a higher per head uh, staffing ratio than other parts uh, of the UK. So in Scotland, 8.4 qualified nurses and midwives per 1,000 population compared to uh, just 5.9 in England. Uh, so that's the record of this government. But of course, we need to do more because of that pressure, which is why uh, we are investing in greater recruitment and supporting health boards across the country to recruit more uh, nurses and other professionals into our National Health Service. Uh, in terms of the issues uh, around the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, there was uh, research published uh, by the Royal College this week, which we will be engaging with them to better understand. The analysis appears to use research findings from England four years ago to make extrapolations from Scottish-only data uh, now, so we want to understand that in more detail. That said, uh, everybody recognises the relationships between long waits in A&E uh, that are not clinically justified and increased risk of harm to patients. Uh, nobody can or should deny that, which is why we are investing uh, in trying to cut A&E waiting times and improve the flow through our hospitals. Uh, and that brings me to the issue of the new guidance that has been issued for A&E. Um, and this is where Anna Sarwar can't quote the Royal College of Emergency Medicine when it suits them and ignore the views of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine uh, when it doesn't uh, suit, suit him. Because we are not turning anyone away uh, from accident in emergency. This is about ensuring that people get the right care in the right place. And this is what... Uh, the Vice President of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine has said they support this guidance in order to ensure that all patients receive the right care at the right time in the right place. It will, on occasion, be appropriate to signpost some people who have presented to an emergency department, but do not require after an appropriate assessment to be seen there to another part of the health care system. That is appropriate. That is a change in guidance that I think was made in England some time ago. It's about making sure that patients get the best care in the right place. And I think that's somebody everybody should support. Um, before I call Anna Sarwar back in, I would be grateful for more succinct questions and responses. I appreciate these are complex issues. Um. I'll come back to the quotes uh, in a moment, but uh, we've heard these same excuses week after week. The situation is getting worse across our NHS. Uh, and why does Nicola Surgeon think she knows better than the professionals on the front line? So let me quote Colin Pullman from the Royal College of Nursing. You've heard uh, the quote today from the First Minister. Colin Pullman's words, despite the Scottish Government's talk about record levels of staffing, these figures show that the shortfall in registered nurses needed to run NHS services has never been higher. They say there's a shortfall of almost 3,500 nurses. She talks about selectively quoting the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. I'll quote the words of Dr John Thompson directly. What we are seeing, ambulance handover delays, dangerous crowding, long stays, put patient safety at risk and can lead to harm or avoidable deaths. Nicola Sturgeon wants to pretend that this is a recent problem, but this is a crisis years in the making. So when will Nic why does Nicola Sturgeon think that she is right, but the professionals on the front line delivering our quality health care and the people we applauded our heroes are wrong? First Minister. I, I don't. And if Anna Sarwar had listened to what uh, I said, uh, he would have heard uh, me actually say that we were listening to uh, the frontline professionals. So the numbers I have quoted on nurse numbers are facts. Uh, they are the facts. An 11 per cent increase in nurses and midwives since we uh, took office. But I went on to say that that's not enough because the pressure on our health service has increased. Uh, so we are listening to those on the front line and we are supporting health boards uh, with additional investment to recruit more. 
uh, staff into our health service to help deal with that pressure. Similarly, in terms, uh, Anna Sarwar stood up and said that we were somehow uh, not listening to those in the front line by, in his words, uh, turning people away from accident and emergency. Uh, that's not the case. We're recognising the pressure on accident and emergency, recognising the need to ensure that people get the right care in the right place and trying to find the solutions. And the solution or the part of the solution uh, that is encapsulated in the new guidance is actually supported by those on the front line, uh, by the very person that Anas Sarwar has quoted, John Thompson, the VP of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, who says this is the right thing to do to ensure that patients get the right care at the right time in the right place. Uh, so we recognise the challenge. We absolutely recognise the challenge, but we are listening to those in the front line in coming up with the best and the right solutions. <laughs> Ms. Nicholas Sturridge's rhetoric can't hide from the reality. The SNP has been in government for 14 years. Yeah. Nicholas Sturridge was health secretary for four years. She's been first minister for seven years. There must come a point when it can't be somebody else's fault. So let's look at Nicholas Sturgeon's record. Nicholas Sturgeon cut nurse training places as health secretary. We now have 3,500 nurse shortages in our NHS. Nicholas Sturgeon cut hospital beds by almost 1,500 in the last decade. We are now chronically short of NHS beds. And Nicholas Sturgeon has been warned for months about the challenges facing A&E, and we now have people dying because of record A&E waiting times. Earlier this week, the First Minister described Scotland as a nation in waiting. She's right, waiting on record long NHS treatment lists, waiting for an ambulance, waiting at A&E and waiting for her to take responsibility. When will Nicola Sturgeon get a grip of the NHS crisis? First Minister. I take responsibility every day and with respect to Anna Sarwar, I've only held the positions I have held for as long as I have because on several occasions I put the record of, of me and the ministerial post I've held and the record of the government before the people of Scotland and been re-elected uh, with the trust of the people of Scotland to face up to these challenges. So under... Under the years we have spent in government, the 11% increase in the nurses and midwives working in our National Health Service, uh, we have increased uh, the training of nurses' overall intake for pre-registration, nursing and midwifery, increased by 5.8%. Uh, this year. So that is what we are doing. We are recognising the acute challenges in our National Health Service, shared by health services across the world, largely because of the COVID pandemic. And we're bringing forward the solutions uh, to support those working on the front line and to support patients across the country. And that is what the people of Scotland have entrusted us to continue to do. We now move on to supplementary questions and I call Eleanor Whittam. I am sure that the First Minister will share my disappointment and deep concern at the announcement by Rochelle Healthcare that their guardian facility in Garvin and my constituency will close in 2022 with a loss of 75 jobs over the next four months. As a long-established business and employer which provides the NHS with surgical drapes, gowns and tray wraps as well as PPE during the pandemic, I would be grateful to the First Minister for her advice on what the Scottish Government can do to support the very skilled workforce and our very fragile rural, rural economy, which will be hugely impacted by this closure decision. First Minister. Well, can I thank Eleanor Whitton for raising uh, what I know is a very important constituency issue for her. I was uh, certainly concerned to learn that Gardy and Surgical had announced the closure of its factory in Girvan and Warehouse in Ayr. And I know this will be a difficult time for the company's staff, their families and the local areas affected, especially at this time of uncertainty caused by the pandemic. Um, I can advise uh, Parliament that the Business Minister has spoken with the company to explore available options for the sites and its workers. Scottish Enterprise will continue to engage with the company to discuss alternatives to closure. Obviously, the individuals affected are our immediate priority, and we've already provided information on support available for affected employees through the PACE initiative. I will ask the Business Minister uh, to keep Eleanor Whittam updated and indeed to keep the Chamber more widely updated on this matter. Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, earlier this week, I was contacted by a constituent whose doctor, adopted daughter was referred to CAMS in early 2017. Since then, she has been passed from caseworker to caseworker, each time with her parents feeling they were starting from scratch. After five years of this, without receiving a confirmed diagnosis, they were told that their daughter will likely require medical intervention and so must be seen by a child psychologist, the waiting time for which is apparently at least three years by which time this young girl will have spent almost eight years in the CAM system without a proper diagnosis or access to appropriate treatment. 
Does the First Minister believe it is acceptable for any child to be referred to CAMS in Primary 1 and potentially not receive treatment until they are in S2? And what can she do to assist this family and any other who have been forced to wait such an obscenely long time for help? First Minister. No, I don't think that is remotely acceptable. Obviously, I am not able uh, to comment on the individual case, although if uh, Brian Whittle uh, wants to write to me or to the Health Secretary, uh, we will look into that uh, and liaise with the Health Board in relation uh, to the particular case. I absolutely understand the distress and the added anxiety that will have been caused by that length uh, of time waiting for appropriate intervention. More generally, of course, uh, we are investing heavily uh, in uh, CAMS uh, and also to redesign how uh, mental health support is provided to children and adolescents, uh, investing more in early intervention support, so councillors and schools, for example, the wellbeing service that is being rolled out, uh, in order to make sure that young people get help earlier, but also to ensure then that specialist services are there uh, for those who most need specialist services. Uh, so this is an area of significant priority uh, so that we can get to the position where every young person who needs uh, the support of mental health services gets the right support uh, and gets that timorously. Uh, but I'd be very happy to look into the individual case. I call Paul O'Kane. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, in response to Anna Sarwar, uh, the First Minister uh, in engaged on the RCN report that was published today, showing that this year we have seen the highest ever shortfall in nursing, with over 3,400 nursing vacancies. With vague promises of only 1,000 health and care workers in the NHS winter plan, this scarcely begins to address the challenge. Nurses are saying that the shortfalls add to significant pressure, and that is why they are currently considering industrial action. So can the First Minister tell me when she will engage with the RCN's demands to pay our nurses fairly, and when will she tell our Cabinet Secretary to fix his inadequate recoveries plan? First Minister, the, the Government engages with the RCN and uh, other unions and professional bodies regularly. The Health Secretary is telling me he met with the RCN as part of a, a staff side engagement just yesterday, uh, so that engagement is ongoing. Um, I absolutely recognise the significant pressures that nurses and others in our health service are working under. Uh, there are significant recruitment challenges, not just across our NHS and social care, but across our whole economy, exacerbated, of course, uh, by other developments uh, around Brexit. But we are focused on supporting health boards to recruit uh, more people, not just nurses, but other professionals, into our health service, and will continue to engage with unions and others as we do so. Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the outbreak of bird flu in Angus and the cull of a flock of birds that is taking place as we speak. Can she provide an update on this issue and let us know what guidance is being issued to local communities? First Minister. Uh, well, this obviously is an important issue and one that I know will be causing concern. A small uh, premises near our growth has tested positive uh, for avian influenza. Uh, public health advice remains that the risk to human health is very low. Food standards bodies advise that avian influenza pose a very low food safety risk uh, for consumers uh, and does not affect the consumption of poultry uh, products, including eggs in order to limit any further spread uh, of disease amongst birds. Appropriate restrictions have been imposed on the affected uh, premises. Uh, public health staff are liaison uh, with others, Health Protection Scotland, to ensure the correct protocols are followed. Um, there were some surviving birds on the premises and uh, uh, these were euthanised on welfare grounds with ongoing support being provided uh, to the owner. Uh, the Rural Affairs uh, Secretary, of course, will be happy to engage with any member uh, who wishes further information on the steps that are being taken. Jackie Dunbar. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is working to ensure that during COP26 it provides a platform for unheard voices, including citizens, young people and those from the Global South. First Minister. Uh, the, uh, the Scottish Government has Sorry, been working. For, First Minister, can I, can I just um, interrupt there? I think there's been a misunderstanding. Yeah, I'm taking so supplementary questions at the moment, Ms Dunbar, and that was your question that we will reach in due course. Um, can I call Jamie Green, please? Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I've been contacted this week by many worried constituents. <clears throat> One is Ron Cooper from Ardrossan. He works in a care home. He had his second COVID vaccine in March, but he's been waiting over a month for his booster due to problems both online and with the telephone system. Another 89-year-old lady who should be on the homebound booster vaccination list has been struggling to get an appointment. We believe there may be hundreds of similar people in North Ayrshire in the same boat. Many of these are elderly, vulnerable and, I think, rightly concerned people uh, looking ahead into winter, needing these much-needed jabs. In light of these examples, can I ask the First Minister what reassurance you can offer the wider public uh, that this year's winter flu and COVID booster programme has been adequately planned and has been executed successfully. 
First Minister. Uh, obviously, these are important issues. I would say to any member, if uh, they are hearing uh, reports in their constituencies or regions uh, about people finding it difficult to access either the COVID booster, uh, JAGS or the flu vaccination, to raise these with the Health Secretary so that any issues can be looked into. Generally, both of these vaccination programmes, uh, they are being delivered on an integrated basis, are going extremely uh, well. So as of uh, right now, uh, 800, more than 850,000 people aged over 12 have received a, a third dose or booster uh, vaccination. I think last week, uh, in terms of combined uh, flu and COVID doses, more than uh, 500,000 uh, doses were delivered. Um, I think we are uh, ahead of uh, some other parts of the UK in terms of delivery of this. So overall, the programme is going extremely well, thanks uh, to the dedication of those working on it across uh, the country. Uh, but as I've said uh, openly before, uh, there will be instances where individuals experience difficulties and it's important that they are raised so that they can be addressed as quickly as possible. Question number three, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what public advice the Scottish Government has issued regarding the discharge of fireworks, given that new regulations came into force on 30th June 2021. <laughs> First Minister. We've taken several steps to highlight the nuisances and risks associated with fireworks and the new limitations on when they can be used out with organised displays uh, that is only between 6pm and midnight on bonfire night itself and between 6pm and 11pm on most other nights of the year. Uh, we funded three targeted publicity campaigns as well as promoting key messages on social media. We've also funded extra engagement by trading standards officers with retailers and others are also playing a very important role. The Scottish Fire Rescue Service, obviously, Police Scotland, Community Safety Partnerships and a range of charities from Crime Stoppers to the SSPCA are putting huge effort into advisory activity to minimise distress and harm for people and for animals across Scotland. Christine Graham. I thank the First Minister for replying. Declare an interest as convener of the cross-party group on animal welfare and indeed as the owner of Mr Smokey, a rescue cat. These regulations on the limitation of sale and the discharge of fireworks are much welcomed by animal welfare organisations, pet owners, and even many less experienced pet owners because of COVID. As previously, as we are aware, with the increasing days of fireworks, it was impossible to keep animals safely indoors. But it also affects livestock because all animals have more acute senses than us, causing suffering, stress and anxiety. Too many come to harm and even death, so this is welcomed by the farming community too. Therefore, can I ask the First Minister, will she advise how the impact of these regulations will be monitored and what the maximum penalties are for breaching these regulations? First Minister. Well, firstly, I very much agree with Christine Graham. Uh, the, the harm that misuse of fireworks can do to animals and livestock uh, is well known and a very serious issue. But misuse of fireworks also does uh, real harm and, and causes real distress and anxiety to humans in communities across the country. Uh, part of my own constituency has in many uh, recent years been affected uh, by this and I've, I've seen the distress caused uh, directly. Uh, so these changes I hope will help uh, alleviate the situation in terms of how we will assess the impact. Uh, the new restrictions uh, of the new restrictions, we're working with trading standards officers to assess the position. We'll also be engaging with Police Scotland and other partners in relation to the restrictions uh, and monitoring the impact uh, of them. And in terms of animal welfare, we'll also take input from organisations like the SSPCA and the British Veterinary Association, who played a very constructive role as members of the Firework Review Group. In terms of penalties for breaching the new regulations, uh, they are uh, potentially imprisonment for up to six months and or a fine of up to £5,000. Of course, for serious misuse, other offences with higher penalties might also be relevant. Pauline McNeill. Every year in the run-up to bonfire night, the Fire Brigade responds to hundreds of calls due to under uncontrolled bonfires, as well as the misuse of fireworks, which terrorises communities at this time of the year. And we thank the Fire and Rescue Service for protecting our communities. But as part of my casework in Glasgow, I've been sent videos of fireworks being launched horizontally down streets, causing damage to property and even trapping residents in their home until either the police arrive or the people responsible move on. First Minister, I wholeheartedly welcome the new regulations and the work that the Minister Ash Reagan has done on this. But if this year we see the same patterns in our communities being terrorised by the misuse of fireworks, may I ask how tough is the First Minister prepared to be to protect our communities from the misuse of fireworks? First Minister. Uh, well, I have to say, uh, I have developed uh, 
largely because of the experience in my own constituency, uh, a, a bit of a zero tolerance to this. Uh, over the years, I have seen uh, instances like uh, those that Pauline McNeill has outlined uh, in particularly the Pollock Shields area of my constituency. I've worked uh, on a local basis with the Fire and Rescue Service, with the police and others to try to alleviate some of that impact. And I think uh, these new uh, restrictions that are in place will make a difference. If they don't make a sufficient difference, uh, we will be willing to look at going further and being tougher. There is, and I say this simply as a statement of fact, there is a devolved, reserved split of responsibilities, which means that the Scottish Government cannot necessarily go as far as we might like to go. Um, and there has been at least on my uh, constituency, MP colleague Alison Thewlis, I know has raised this in the House of Commons, uh, to try to get more collaboration between the Scottish and the UK government uh, in tackling this. Uh, so we will be willing to look at this if this year's uh, changes do not have the desired impact. But I would say, obviously, people want to responsibly enjoy uh, bonfire nights, of course, which is uh, tomorrow. Uh, but to say to people uh, across the country to do so responsibly and remember the impact that the misuse of fireworks can have, uh, at best, uh, that is inconvenience and anxiety and distress. At worst, that can be serious injury and even death. And, and Therefore, responsibility is absolutely paramount on the part of everyone. Siobhan Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A few weeks ago, there was a tragic explosion in my constituency in Kincaid and Inair, where a family of four still remain in hospital. Within days, some members of the public let off fireworks, which of course caused a lot of fear and concern to this community. Can I ask what discussions the Scottish Government has had with Police Scotland in relation to enforcing new firework regulation? First Minister. Well, as I uh, have already outlined, uh, the Scottish Government uh, has had extensive uh, engagement and consultation with the police and with other partners and stakeholders over a long period of time now um, in coming to the new and tighter restrictions that are in place. And we will also continue that in terms of the enforcement and assessment of those restrictions. Um, I certainly appreciate uh, the particular local issue that has been raised. I think any of us uh, seeing the pictures of the explosion in the members' constituency that evening uh, just seeing the pictures on social media uh, understand the shock and therefore there will be particular sensitivity in that area around fireworks this bonfire night. So I will uh, ask uh, the relevant minister to particularly engage with the police locally and nationally uh, on that particular issue and engage with the member as well. Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what immediate steps the Scottish Government is taking to address the reported oh, continuing inequalities in cancer... Oh. Yes, I'm still taking supplementary questions ah. at the moment, um, but we will get to you in due course. Thank you. I will therefore move on to question number four, Stephen Kerr. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether Scotland is on track to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2045. First Minister. Uh, yes, I think we are, but I don't think it will be easy and I don't think we can take success for granted. We will have to work hard to achieve it. The scale of the challenge to bridge the global emissions gap is immense. In Scotland right now, we are over halfway to net zero and we have decarbonised faster uh, than any G20 country, but we have much more to do. Uh, through our updated climate change plan and associated commitments, we've set out a comprehensive, credible package of policies for reducing emissions over the next decade, putting us on track, I believe, for a just transition to net zero by 2045. And our priority, obviously, is to deliver on those policies. Of course, the recent UK government decision not to support the Scottish uh, carbon capture and storage cluster uh, does not make that easier and is a serious mistake. I'm therefore today writing to the Prime Minister calling upon him to reverse this decision and accelerate the Scottish cluster to full track one status without delay. Stephen Kerr. The, uh, the First Minister's climate change strategy stated that local authorities were on the front line of Scotland's response to the climate emergency. But an extensive piece of published research by my own office reveals that the Scottish Government, well, Do you may continue, laugh. Mr. Kerr. You, you may laugh at this research, but I think you should take it seriously. But research by my own voice reveals that the Scottish Government has given little or no support to councils in preparing their plans, agreed no targets, and hasn't even bothered to read them. So why does the First Minister have any confidence that local authority plans will deliver cuts to emissions when she and her government have shown so little interest in them. First Minister. 
Um, I, I just don't think that is true. I mean, I'd obviously be fascinated to read the research prepared uh, by Saving Care's uh, office. I mean that genuinely. I'm sure he'll send me a copy and I will uh, give a commitment today to read it in full and uh, then come back to him with any comments uh, that I feel are appropriate. Local government does have a big part to play in this and I have confidence um, in the priority that local councils across the, the country are giving to this. I uh, have had uh, discussions uh, with local council uh, members in the, the context of COP this week and more generally. I've also had the uh, privilege of uh, meeting local government representatives from other parts of the UK, the Mayor of London yesterday, the, the Mayor of Paris yesterday, and all uh, local government are, are grappling with these challenges and there's a, a real intent uh, on sharing uh, good practice and, and sharing best practice. But our responsibility is to make sure we meet our targets. Uh, we're halfway there, but the next half of the journey will be more difficult. That is why uh, we cannot afford to be undermined on any of the key yeah. strands of our work. Uh, so I would say to Stephen Kerr in return for my commitment to read the research uh, prepared by his office. I wonder if he would join me today in writing to the Prime Minister asking for yes. the short-sighted decision on the ACORN project and the Scottish cluster to be overturned so that we can get back on track with carbon capture and not allow his Tory colleagues to take the feet from us on that. So perhaps that's something he will give consideration to. <laughs> Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The meeting our net uh, zero target by 2045 requires us to hit the interim target in 2030. It was designed to be ambitious but achievable, but it depends on government action. Given the Chief Executive of the Climate Change Committee believes the target now looks, quote, overcooked, and the Scottish Government has already missed the last three emissions target, what does the First Minister plan to do differently to get us back on track to meet this interim target? First Minister. Well, firstly, you know, I, I think it is right that we are ambitious, and I would rather this Parliament, because remember the 75% reduction target for 2030 was a decision of Parliament, uh, and I would rather this Parliament was being said to be over-ambitious rather than under-ambitious, because actually that is the charge that can be levelled uh, at too many governments uh, around the negotiating table uh, at COP. Uh, the Committee on Climate Change, I think, if memory serves me, correctly expressed its reservations about the 75 per cent target when Parliament was considering this, and Parliament took a decision uh, to, to be that ambitious, and I think Parliament was right to do so. It is now incumbent on the Government to lead uh, by example, and all of us to make sure we do everything uh, necessary to meet that target. Uh, on the, the missed targets, again, to be open, we have got stretching targets, and we have fallen short in the last three years uh, of quite meeting those. Uh, we should have cut emissions by 55 per cent uh, if we would hit our targets. We haven't done that, but we have cut emissions by 51.5 per cent. That is the halfway to net zero, and we have decarbonised faster than any G20 country. So I think Scotland is leading by example, but we must do more. What are we doing differently? We've set out the details of that in our climate change update plan, the catch-up plan that was published last week. The most recent target, of course, was 2019. So uh, much of what we are doing to catch up in that, which we're legally bound to do, has already been set out in this parliament. So the, the plans are ambitious, the targets are ambitious, but frankly, all of us have a responsibility to step up and make sure we are meeting this challenge head on. Question number five, Jackie Bailey. To ask the First Minister what immediate steps the Scottish Government is taking to address the reported continuing inequalities in cancer mortality rates across Scotland. First Minister. But we continue to focus on ensuring equitable access to cancer services throughout the pandemic. For example, we've seen mutual aid across health boards so that every patient is seen according to their priority. We continue to provide support through the Screening Inequalities Fund to increase screening rates across all groups in our society. And we've also recently completed a second funding round of our uh, more than £100 million National Cancer Plan, where the impact on equalities was a key criteria in the funding awarded. Uh, finally, to reduce mortality from cancer, we know that the most effective means is by early detection, which is why we continue to invest in our Detect Cancer Early programme. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for that response? Public Health Scotland published cancer figures for 2019, which showed that 28% of people living in deprived areas are more likely to get cancer, and a staggering 66% are more likely to die from cancer. And that's before the pandemic. There is a substantial backlog in screening, early detection rates are falling, health boards are cancelling operations due to the pressure, and more people are likely to die because they are simply being diagnosed too late. Will the First Minister ensure that, at the very least, 
cancer surgery and treatment is not cancelled or delayed this winter? Will she take urgent action to improve cancer outcomes for everyone, including those who are the most disadvantaged in our society, because these figures, frankly, are a national scandal? First Minister. Well, firstly, to be very, very clear, cancer treatment and surgery is always prioritised by health boards, and I would hope Jackie Bailey would, would recognise uh, that. Um, and indeed, uh, any operation for cancer uh, that is cancelled uh, would only be done in the most extreme uh, circumstances, and that is a priority that health boards give and have given right throughout the pandemic. Uh, Jackie Bailey is right uh, to point out, to the, uh, point out the Public Health Scotland cancer mortality uh, statistics that were published uh, this week. Uh, I, I won't uh, repeat uh, the statistics she has quoted because they are absolutely correct but it is important it, to give the context that they also show that the overall risk of dying from cancer in 2019 fell by nearly 10 percent so that is that is positive uh, but there are significant inequalities in terms of the outcomes from cancer that is why uh, there's a range of work underway that we need to make sure gets the priority it merits raising awareness providing equitable access to screening yes catching up on the backlogs that have been caused by COVID, early detection, making sure that early detection is being focused on not just in where there are uh, the more common symptoms of cancer, uh, but some of, of the less common symptoms as well. That's why the early diagnostic cancer centres are being set up uh, to make sure that that happens. So Jackie Bailey is right to raise the importance of this and the government is right to have the focus we do on making sure that we are putting forward the solutions and ensuring the priority for cancer care. Question number six, Jackie Dunbar. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is working to ensure that during COP26 it provides a platform for unheard voices, including citizens, young people and those from the Global South. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government is committed to amplifying the voices of young people and those experiencing the worst impacts of climate change in the Global South. We have uh, provided almost £950,000 of funding to support young people of all backgrounds to participate meaningfully at COP26 and beyond, including £300,000 for the Conference of Youth, which will present its global statement uh, to COP26 tomorrow. Uh, we are also ensuring representatives from the Global South are heard through the Global Climate Assembly, the Glasgow Climate Dialogues and events, including a youth-focused event with Malawi climate leaders uh, that will take place on Monday. Jackie Dunbar. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Women and girls are likely to suffer disproportionately as a result of the climate crisis, which is why the Scottish Glasgow Women's Leadership Statement, jointly sponsored by the Scottish Government and UN Women, is so important, as it recognises that women must be part of the response. Does the First Minister hope that where small nations lead, this will galvanise other organisations and world leaders to follow and make similar ambitious statements and commitments during COP26? First Minister. Uh, yes, I absolutely uh, agree with Jackie Dimbar about the importance of this issue. Uh, we know that women and girls across the world are disproportionately impacted by climate change, uh, but we also know that they must be more involved in the solutions uh, to climate change. So I've been really delighted to work over uh, recent times with UN Women uh, to put forward this Glasgow Women's Leadership Statement that we launched uh, at COP26 earlier uh, this week uh, did that alongside women leaders from both large and small nations and I've been very encouraged by the response since uh, with uh, more and more signatories from governments and civil society coming forward to join this initiative. I'm also looking forward to taking part in Gender Day at COP uh, which is next Tuesday when I hope we will see many more countries coming forward with very strong commitments on gender responsive climate action. Question number seven, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Government's response is to Glasgow City Council cleansing workers taking strike action from the 1st of November and throughout the COP26 conference due to low pay. First Minister. Well, firstly, I recognise and appreciate the extraordinary efforts of council workers uh, at all times, but particularly over the past 18 months. Uh, that is why, although the Scottish Government has no formal role in the local government pay negotiations, we supported efforts to find a solution with a one-off offer of additional funding of £30 million. Uh, I was pleased to see that this intervention, along with a contribution uh, from councils, enabled COSLA to submit a significantly improved pay offer to trade unions last Friday. The unions subsequently confirmed that they would suspend strike action while members voted on the revised offer, and I welcome that. Uh, I think it is therefore disappointing that the GMB in Glasgow uh, have chosen to pursue strike action at this stage, although, of course, I uh, respect the right to do so, but I would urge all parties in Glasgow to quickly find a resolution. Paul Sweeney. 
As a member of the GMB trade union, I think Glasgow City Council threatening to union bust uh, by using anti-trade union laws and busting in blackleg private contractors to try to break the strike is disgraceful and a paltry short-term fix to this long-running dispute. So if the First Minister agrees with this position, will she please intervene and provide the leadership that has been sorely lacking so far and, if necessary, commit additional financial resources so that COSLA and Glasgow City Council can settle this dispute and pay these key workers fairly and treat them with respect. First Minister. Well, of course, the things that Paul Sweeney talk about would be disgraceful if they were happening, but they're not. And let's be very clear about that. As I understand it, although I'm not party uh, to this, it was made clear by the Council uh, last Friday, uh, I think that they were not uh, going to take uh, legal action. But also on uh, this suggestion of breaking the strike, uh, I know a statement was issued uh, last night. The Council do have a concern um, about bonfire night posing a, an additional fire risk if rubbish is not collected. Uh, so what they are considering is cover to mitigate these risks. Uh, what they are not considering is using contractors to fulfil the regular duties of striking staff. Now, Labour should know all about that because they did do that during the cleansing strike under the previous Labour administration in 2009. So perhaps a bit of reflection on the Labour benches would be welcome. Uh, this, what, this situation in Glasgow has arisen out of a national pay dispute. Uh, the Government did last week make additional resources available to allow COSLA to make a renewed offer. COSLA has made a renewed offer. The unions rightly suspended strike action to allow members to vote uh, on that renewed offer, and I, I think that is a process that should be allowed to take its course. Uh, I have the utmost respect for cleansing workers uh, in Glasgow, those uh, who do that job in my constituency and across uh, the city. That's why I do hope uh, the Glasgow City Council and the union can get round the table and find a resolution uh, that puts an end to this and allows industrial relations to move forward positively. That concludes First Minister's questions. We will now move on to members' business. Point of order, Paul Sweeney. Point of order, uh, in a point of order, um, presiding officer, it was mentioned by the First Minister that uh, strike breaking activity took place in 2009. As a matter of record, no such strike breaking action took place, and the statement issued by Glasgow City Council to this effect today is in fact inaccurate. I'd be happy if the Chair would confirm if that is the case. The Member will be aware that the content of members' contributions is not a matter for the Chair. There does, however, exist a mechanism by which members can correct any inaccurate information. Thank you.